Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our intrepid physical audience, and welcome to all of those of you who are watching online this evening. So this is our third lecture in the 2022 series, Food for Thought, hosted on the McDonald campus of McGill University. Our theme this year for the lecture series is the Food, Water, Energy Nexus, Dignified Lives for Billions on a Finite Planet. I'm Grant Clark, Associate Professor in the Department of Bioresource Engineering, and I'm one of the organizers of the series, along with um, Anne-Sophie Charon, Caron, I keep saying Charon instead of Caron, and uh, Anna Duff. And uh, I would like to begin with our land acknowledgement. I am a descendant of Northern European settlers, and I live and work on Teochiagi, which is the unceded territory of the Ganayaga Nation. These people are the custodians of the surrounding lands and rivers. To the south of Montreal is the community of Ganawage, and to the west, the community of Ganasetage. And I thank the Ganayaga Nation for watching over these lands and waters as they have since time immemorial. Housekeeping, um, primarily for the online viewers this evening, please keep your audio muted during the lecture. Uh, and Sophie will monitor the chat window and relay any questions to the speaker if you'd like to ask them that way. And when we reach the end of the presentation, there'll be a question and answer period. And at that time, you can unmute yourself and ask questions, and we'll be able to hear you over the speakers in the classroom. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Ebenezer Mieza Kofi. Uh, is an assistant professor in the Department of Bioresource Engineering, where he also co-directs the Integrated Food and Bioprocess Engineering Program. He completed his graduate studies in the Department of Bioresource Engineering, and then spent some time working at the University of Arkansas before we successfully lured him back again to Montreal. In 2021, he received the McDonald Campus Distinguished Young Alumni Award, Mieza's research in sustainable food systems explores the trade-offs and synergies among the environment, economics, and product quality. His current interests include the use of life cycle assessment to optimize food production systems, circular bioeconomy pathways, and decision support systems to promote sustainable and healthy food choices amongst consumers. So the topic of his presentation this evening is Connecting the Dots for a Sustainable Healthy Diet Culture, the Role of an Industry Consumer Nexus. Niza. Hello, good Hello. evening. Can, can you hear me? Those online, can they hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. All right, so um, I'm going to talk about um, sustainable, healthy diet culture so that this um, issue of eating healthy but also sustainable food does not become a one-day event, but something which is part of us. And so to do that, I will... Um, talk first about where we are now in terms of um, transitioning to a sustainable healthy diet, where we are so that when we can understand um, the issues at stake and we would appreciate what effort we need to put in to get us to where we ought to be. So I'll begin with that. And let me begin with what the food system is and the complexity uh, that it has. The food system, it's a complete set of different set of stakeholders, including the people involved, um, the institutions, and this could include academic research institution, government institution, um, also the activities that happen from one point to the other, from production to processing to distribution till um, we get the food on our table, and also the processes and the infrastructure. And so the whole process from producing to consumption and what we do afterwards, it's all part of the um, food system. But this food system 
has been in the last few years has been described within a broader context of sustainable development goals. Now, what that means is that I'll just share the slides so people online can see them. Sorry, oops. Sorry about that. Good. So this has been um, in the last few years been being described within, within a broader context so that we are not only interested in what we're eating, but the quality of what we're eating and all the things that are connected with it in terms of energy, in terms of water and all of that. And so this is um, a global call calling everyone into action to ensure we secure our planet, that everybody has food to eat. But if you see, for us to appreciate where we are, we need to look at different dimension of the food system. And so I'm going to describe this within four dimensions, food security, nutrition, social justice and environmental sustainability. Let's begin with the food security. In 2016, uh, in 2015, the UN um, promoted the sustainable development goal. And the idea uh, was that one of them was that we will reduce hunger to zero. But if you look at this, what we see here, you see that across board, we're nowhere near zero hunger. In fact, if you look at all the numbers, almost all the region, this is the, the, um, the global data, you can see from 2014 to 2020, it's been going up. If you look at it across board, maybe um, within North America, it seemed to be flattened. But even with that, there's a slight increase. But otherwise, across board, it's increasing. If you look at the number of people who are food insecure, between 2019 and the time the pandemic started in 2020, by the end of 2020, the number had jumped from 135 million to 265 million. And so the whole idea that we're working towards zero hunger, we seem to be going in the opposite direction. If you look at it in terms of nutrition, the numbers here shows that we have more people who are overweight. We have this number of um, women who are affected by uh, anemia. We have a number of over 156 million people and uh, children who are stunted, meaning they're too short for their age. We have about 50 million that are too thin for their hearts. But this issue of malnutrition does not affect only one country. If you look at the mark here, it means that at least everywhere globally, everybody is suffering from at least one burden. But if you look at the color, you see some places are suffering from a triple burden. And what is the cost of solving this issue of malnutrition. If you look at the data, it's showing that malnutrition costs 3.5 trillion per year to the global economy. So the cost of not eating enough or eating nutritious food comes with economic cost. If you look at it from environmental point of view, in terms of greenhouse gases, our food system contributes, this number um, ranges from 25% to about 30%. In terms of land use, agriculture and our food system account for about 50% of land use. 
If you look at water, the food we eat account for 70% of the global fresh water withdrawals. So, which means that if we make any effort in enhancing the food system, we will be saving our world. Now, if you also look at it in terms of how we've been doing across the different years, you see from this graph that Europe and the Oceania seem to be doing well in terms of relative proportion or increase in greenhouse gas, if you compare the years to 1960, we use that as a reference here and look at how it changes. And you could see that this is Asia, it's up there. If you look at um, Africa, it's rising. If you look at um, North America, we are not doing as much as is being done in Europe. So what it means is that we need to up our game if the intent is to reduce the environmental impact on uh, our food system. If you look at this data here, it shows that if we keep business as usual, then the environmental implication would increase by 50 to 90%. So there are different issues, but one cross-cutting one is the issue of food waste. And this has been a big problem for ages. Um, I, I, I say that if we can solve the issue of food waste, we don't have to produce more food. But we have known this problem for a long time except we have not been able to provide um, a concrete solution because if you look at the data, how much food is wasted in Europe, North America, and Asia, it's equivalent in terms of mass to what is produced in Africa. Africa produces about 230 uh, million tons of food what is wasted in, in North America, Europe, and Asia, it's 222. So it's almost the same. Meanwhile, we have about 821 people who go to bed without food. And so if we come to Canada, our home, we are doing much worse because the global number is between 30 and 40. And so if this uh, Waste Canada Week, which um, is a national program, seems to suggest that this is how much we're wasting. That's way above even the global average. So what happens if we decide to do nothing? If we leave things as they are? this would be the consequences. At the moment, one in eight people go to bed without food, but that number is going to increase if we do nothing. Food prices will be expected to double, and we're already seeing that. Things are gradually going up. Well, perhaps now we can attribute part of it to Ukraine, but they were going up even before the war started. The other thing is that even though about a third, 30% uh, to 40% food is being wasted, if we don't change things, then that number is going to go up. And what was predicted as um, the environmental damage to, um, as a result of the food system, is actually going to be a reality if we don't do anything about it. So, if we decide to do something, what can we envisage how our new um, world would be from a food system perspective? So if we think of 
a sustainable, healthy diet culture, which is what we're aiming at, then we would have our food produced in a more responsible ecologically. We would have minimum to no waste. Our food would be healthy. It would be localized. And also that would be fair and it would be fair and accessible. People would have access to the food. But how do we move from where we are now to the desired sustainable healthy diet culture where having food that is sustainable and healthy, it's not a one-time thing, but it's something we do all the time. There are several stakeholders involved within the food system. We have consumers, we have producers, we have different people. So for the rest of the lecture, I want to focus on the two primary stakeholders because this is, uh, they are the core of this process. And the two would be the consumers because at the end of the day, we make a decision on what we want to eat. When we go to the grocery, there are a lot of things, but we make the decision what to buy. And then for the industry, and the industry here means the producers and those who are processing and those who are distributing, these three put together. So what I'm trying to do for the rest of the lecture is to see how can we connect the industry to the consumers so that this culture that we want to build becomes a partnership and not that each one is doing their own thing and they don't care what the other person is doing. Because if we don't work together, then nothing is going to happen. So before we look at specifics, I want to highlight why this nexus is important, why this connection is so important. It's important for the industry and it's important for the individual. So there was this study that was published in 2017 that says that improving diet could potentially prevent one in every five deaths globally. Imagine if we had a drug or a medication that could avoid one in five deaths. That would be a blockbuster. But we seem to have that because that's what making the right choice of food can lead to. In 2019, the um, Heart and Stroke Foundation um, commissioned a, a research into looking at um, ultra processed food. And then the data showed that if for those eating um, ultra, more of ultra processed food. They have a 31 higher odds of obesity, 37% higher odds of diabetes, and 60% higher odds of high blood pressure compared to those that are consuming least amount of ultra processed food. Now, what does this mean? It means that there has to be some kind of communication between the guys producing it and the guys actually buying and eating it. But for when it comes to consumers, we, we seem to be changing what we want. Now, if you look at this report by, it was done by Pacewise, it shows here that when people buy food, what they're looking for, which used to be only health or largely health, they're more concerned about their health. If you look at this data, it's kind of showing here that that interest in health is actually decreasing. Now they are interested in different things connected with sustainability. They're looking for localized food. They're looking for food and, and processes that highlight all these things, climate change, waste, recycling, and all of that. But let me give you a little more granular data regarding what consumers actually want. 
So the um, US e-commerce um, commissioned this report last year, and this is what they found, that for companies, this is e uh, online companies. So now we have a lot of food that are um, even sold online. All the supermarket, Magzi, uh, uh, Costco, they all have online and people buy stuff from online and get delivered. Now, the data shows that those that are promoting sustainability have a 7.7 7 more chance of interaction with the consumers. The results also show that consumers are 1.3 times more willing to pay a premium price for eco-friendly or sustainable products since the pandemic started. Now, what does this mean for the industry? It means that the industry must think about sustainability because that is what the consumer wants. And so if the industry is not paying attention to these trends, then that could be a problem. If you look at this one too, it shows that shoppers are willing to pay a premium for eco-friendly, sustainable product. And if you look at the generation, you see here that it is the millennials and the Gen Z across board. If you look at the total, the Gen Z, Gen X, all of them seem to show a higher trend. And this is 2020, May, 2020, um, August, and 2021. Uh, um, August. So the data shows that there is an increase in sustainability of, of products. And so here, the takeaway is that sustainable eco-friendly products are becoming a marker of a premiumness, especially among millennials and Gen X who are um, entering their prime spending years. And so this is why there need to be that connection between the industry and the consumer, because it helps them understand exactly what consumers are, uh, are looking for, and then they can um, provide that. But what does the industry itself think about um, this sustainable thing? So in 2020, they did this, um, uh, Globescan did this um, survey where they surveyed 700 experts from 71 countries. And the question they were asking was, what are the most urgent actions the private sector should take to increase resilience and ability to withstand future systemic shock? And these were the results. Number one, environmental sustainability. So what it means is that the industry itself is now realizing that they ought to prioritize environmental sustainability. And so if we think about our food, then we want to eat food and get healthy, but then there is nutrition and there is environmental sustainability also. Now, the point here is this, food that are um, environmentally sustainable are not necessarily healthy. And the ones that are um, healthy, the nutritious ones, are not necessarily, they could be, but they're not necessarily environmentally sustainable. What that means is we need to make a conscious effort to find the trade off. Do you prioritize environment over the nutrition, or do you, where, where do you strike the balance? So this becomes very critical. And so what I'm going to do next now is to highlight what we can do or what, for instance, my lab is doing in creating and maintaining some of these connections so that at least um, we can work towards having a sustainable, healthy diet culture. So I'm going to highlight these three things. Number one, looking beyond environmental sustainability. At least the data here showed that we cannot just focus on environment at the expense of nutrition and, and, and other things. And so 
when we talk of sustainability, we need to go beyond the environment. And then also talk about household processing and consumption. Now, this is very critical. Unfortunately, it's usually left out because if you look at a lot of the research, especially from the processing side, it's more focused on the industry. But there is data to suggest that we need to have a shift. We need to look at what happens at home because it's critical. And then the last one I would focus on would be communication and education because there is a lot of misinformation and disinformation and you Google, you go to Google, you find all kinds of things. And so there has to be a conscious effort if we, we, we're really interested in connecting this dot and make this a culture, then there has to be a conscious effort at communication. And for us at an institution here at McGill, we need to make this a priority. Why? Because the people who probably are destroying the world with all the environmental stuff, they are not ignorant people. They are the people with the degree, people with the BSc and MSc and PhD. So the people who know stuff are the, also the people. And so that's why our communication and education ought to be oriented in a way that creates that culture from campus as they move out. So let me begin with looking beyond environmental sustainability. That's the first one. So here, Typically, in the last maybe 20 years, we've been looking at environmental sustainability using life cycle assessment. Now, what is life cycle assessment? It's basically saying that if you look at the whole production chain, if this is B, for example, a steak, now you have the production of the, of the crop that are used in feeding the animals and rearing the animals. We process them, we distribute them either to retail or to uh, uh, restaurants, and then we it's prepared and served, or we buy, we go home, we um, prepare it at home, we eat, and then later we dump whatever is left in the bean. And so that process, when we take each process and we look at what comes in and what goes out, and we examine the environmental impact, that process is called life cycle assessment to, to see it more clearly here. So we look at the different phases of any product from production, processing, distribution, uh, consumption. And then for each of them, we look at the input and output and we examine the impact. And this impact is then categorized into different uh, uh, um, units to help us understand. So for example, we would have uh, uh, global warming, uh, we'll look at ozone depletion and uh, uh, different categories. So basically this is what we have used to understand our impact when it comes to the environment. But if we understand that the whole idea of sustainable development looks beyond the environment, but also the economics and also the, um, the social aspects. Now, between 2016, 2020, I did a, a little bit of international development work with food system, working in different African countries and, and, uh, and Latin America. And one of the things that we did in that time was to work with small scale companies to look at the, the impact of their processes on the environment. Now, this is what we observe. Anytime you do a baseline LC for any company and you provide data, now, if they cannot see economic value in what you're doing, if it's not going to help them make more money, then they are not interested. Because they're in business to make money. So it has to make economic sense for them to do it. And so when we think about environmental impact and we make suggestions as to how we can improve, that suggestion either improve the quality or improve the process so that it has economic return. And so we need to evaluate that. But beyond that, the critical part is what we call the social LCA, which is how does 
the different stakeholders. How do we account for safety, food safety? How do we account for the workers? How do we account for consumers? How, if, if you are in the livestock production, how do you account for animal welfare? Because if you're thinking of a sustainable culture, a healthy, sustainable culture, then it's not just about the environment, but also about the people involved. And so the, the, the social aspect is so critical. Why? Because it helps us identify the risk. So if you're working and you are, your suppliers are using children doing child labor to produce, then you are also contributing to it because you're buying from them, right? And so there has to be a better way of seeing the whole process from where the supplies are coming from. You need to end it. Now, in fact, people are staying home. If you, 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 you walk around, almost all companies, we have vacancies, we have vacancies, we have vacancies. And so the people who work to produce the food alongside the safety of them and the product must be accounted for when we think of sustainability in a more broader sense. Again, the data that we saw earlier showed that when people can see that your product is produced in a more sustainable way that you care about consumers and about workers, it puts you in a good position. And so that communication between the, the, the consumer, making them aware of the things a company is doing to enhance um, sustainability works well for the industry. In fact, there are companies in North America that are supplying to Europe that are now, the Europeans are demanding they want to see the sustainability certificates before they supply. I do work with some companies like that. And, and so what it means is that we need to improve our effort and looking at sustainability more broadly because other companies are asking for it because consumers, that's what they want. The other thing is to now, if we can have all of that together, then we can look at sustainability in a more broader way. The economics, the social, and the environment. Now, because there's always going to be a trade-off, because in an attempt to enhance the social aspect of sustainability, you probably will have to compromise somewhere. And so this you can use multi-criteria decision analysis in order to see where are you willing to compromise? Where do you strike the balance? What, what environmental mitigation is enough? So these are the, 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 the critical things. And, and by doing so, you can also do what we call circular economy because in doing this process, you're able to also identify the best way to use life, your waste. Because um, for a long time, it has been take, use, and dump. But there seems to be value in the waste. If we can find a way of redirecting that into the, into the food system, maybe that could be one way of improving the sustainability of our processes. The other thing is to look at how we're doing globally. If you look at this data, it shows that we have done a lot from on the environmental sustainability portion. We have, if you look at in the Eco Event database, which is one of the life cycle database, we have more than 18,000 um, data set. In terms of life cycle costing, Companies actually do this. They evaluate the cost implication of the processes, but it's usually not published. The social aspect, this is about 1,000 to 5,000 studies. And this is across, but not only food, across all products. And if you look at the, the studies that combine all of this, 
you can see less than 200. So what it basically means is that we are not doing this at all. Now, let me also talk about the household processing. This is so important when we talk about a sustainable, healthy diet culture. If you look at this paper that was published um, in 2020, it shows that sociocultural influences on food choices and the implication of sustainable, healthy diet. Now, what this paper is saying is that the choices people make is not only based on nutrition and the environment, but also on the socioeconomic factors. Now, let me give you an example. I have been in North America for 10 years. There are some food that I used to eat in my home country, Ghana, that I cannot stop eating them. Even if they're not the most healthy, that's what I want to eat. And, and so there is, there is a cultural, social implication when it comes to food choices. And unless we have data to support a movement or a shift from what we used to do, then people don't want to make any change. Unless we can show data that, hey, the way you prepare your food, we know you, 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 you grew with this, but the way you prepare it make you lose a lot of the nutrients. Maybe I'm seeing that data, it will convince me to make changes to how I do it. And that's why it's important that we pay attention to this. There was also this paper that suggests that <laughs> dietary changes in high income nations alone can lead to substantial double climate dividend. So this paper is suggesting that if we can make changes to diet, we can actually meet some of our environmental targets. Now, let me give you example why this is important. So if you look at beans or um, filled peas, and if you distribute the environmental impact at different stages, you see here, the blue one is the consumer stage. And the red one, uh, the yellow one is the farming and you have retail. This data shows that a lot of the impact actually occurs at home. It occurs at home. And so when we only focus on the industrial level without any, uh, um, any focus at home, we are missing out. We're losing a great opportunity to improve uh, uh, environmental sustainability. This is also uh, in terms of nutrition, and this is part of the work that we did um, in Zambia and Malawi. And I'm using beans here. Now, we soak beans so that we cook faster. But how long should we soak the beans there? This data shows that if you soak the beans for eight hours and you cook, you gain about 75 minutes in cooking time. If you soak for 12 hours, you get about 90 minutes, uh, you gain 90 minutes. But look at the loss in terms of nutrition. So if you soak for eight hours, you're losing about 10% of, in this case, is iron. And if you soak for 12 hours, you're losing about 20 something. And if you soak for 16 hours, you're losing about 35% of the iron. Now the question is, do you think that between the 75 minutes and 90 minutes, which is only 15 minutes different, is that 15 minutes worth this percentage law, 10 and 23, that's 13 more. Is it worth it? Maybe it's not. And, and so this is the reason why household processing data is essential so that if people know that by, by soaking for 12 hours, I lose, I lose additional 13% of the 
iron, for instance, then people would make the decision. And so this is why this is important if we want to uh, uh, we want to have a sustainably healthy diet culture. Because even if you fortify your beans and it has high iron fortified and you soak for 16 hours and you're losing it, then what was the point in doing the fortification? So the, this also is to show that, I mean, globally, there's a lot of um, a lot of intervention to help smaller uh, communities. Uh, mostly, a lot of intervention happen here, even here in, in Canada, but mostly in Africa, in Latin America. But if you look at these intervention, they are either focused on nutrition or focused on food security. And so we examine that, okay, there's a need to look, even when we're doing intervention, to look beyond just one component but look in, uh, in the four dimension, the nutrition, the environment, the social, and the economics. And if you look at the, 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 the framework that I use to measure the performance of this intervention, the results show that mostly uh, they focus on nutrition. If you compare to the environment and to the social, you see most of these framework actually do not do well in terms of environment and uh, and the social. It means the focus has been on um, the nutrition. So what we did was, um, in another work, we were focused on looking at um, eight interventions and see how well these interventions were responding to the different dimension that would lead to a sustainable, healthy diet culture. And we realized from here, that most of them were focused on nutrition when it comes to the social, um, not much was happening. So it means that even the interventions that were ongoing were geared in one direction. But if we really want that sustainable culture, then we need to look beyond that. The last one, and then I wrap up, is to look at the communication and education. And here, I want to begin, how do we communicate environment and nutrition to consumers? This should be the responsibility of the, the industry, but the institutions like McGill, like different institutions, government, should participate in this process. Now, if you look at how even LCA is communicated, you do LCA, you have your results in, you have different, um, different categories. So climate change, which usually is the big one that we, we communicate. Now, climate change is communicated in um, carbon dioxide equivalent, kilogram carbon dioxide equivalent. What does that even mean? If we want to reach out to consumers and we're quoting 300 kilo, kilograms carbon dioxide equivalent, what, what do they make out of that? And so there has to be a better way of communicating, even the ones we're doing, the work we're doing, there has to be a better way of communicating that. Other than that, yeah, we're doing it, but it's not getting to where it ought to be. So others are looking at endpoint results. And so here you have human health that look at the, the, indi uh, the um, indicators that will affect human health. And then we have the uh, natural environment and natural resources. And now, People are using echo costs, which is you translate all your results into economic costs, which is more looking at preventable um, option that how much money um, is associated with a particular, particular impact. So part of what my lab has done is to create this environmental nutrition dashboard. And um, this was done when I was in Arkansas. And so we, 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 we built this platform and then you go to a cafeteria 
and you decide to buy whatever food you want to buy, you see the nutrition and environmental implication of the choice you've made. And then you can decide whether you want to go ahead with that or you want to try something else. And so, for example, this is just an example. If you choose animal-based burger, you get this kind of result and you can see the, um, the nutrition implication. And we're using two metrics um, to show that. And then in terms of the environment, we use the environmental costs of doing that. So finally, when it comes to education, this is where the academic institution have the biggest role because if you look at the sustainable development agenda, it has to be built into what we do as an institution in terms of our teaching, in terms of our research, but we also need to demonstrate it, which I think that McGill is doing a fantastic job in that. We have the uh, sustainability office. There's a lot of sustainability project ongoing, but this ought to go on because if we want to create the culture, then it's not a one-time thing. It has to be a continuous thing. If we create or we develop um, graduates that are sustainable, um, uh, sustainable, healthy diet conscious, then we can have that culture go on. And so that's the responsibility. But the other thing which is very important before I now close, is there has to be collaboration. Because if you look at this, you have nutritionists, they know a lot of stuff about nutrition. We have food processors, we know a lot of stuff. So if you, you, you don't collaborate, if you don't have that radical collaboration where different people work on something, like if we wanna look at uh, um, sustainable behavior on campus, it has to be with regard to food. There has to be a food processor. There has to be uh, someone from the production side. There has to be a nutritionist. We need to connect with someone from downtown doing behavioral sciences because we need to get a bigger picture. And so to create the culture requires what I call a radical collaboration with the industry, with consumers. And that way we might make a headway. So. With that, I want to say thank you. All right, so we welcome questions from the audience and questions online. There are any chat. So part of what you were saying earlier on about um, companies in Europe wanting like a sustainability certificate from U.S. companies on imported goods. Um, is there anything preventing, because the, the data clearly shows that it's better for companies to show that they're sustainable, that they align with the interests of the consumer, but is there anything preventing companies for falsifying that data or kind of extrapolating that to get a, a bigger consumer base? Is it, you can just paraphrase the question for the online. Okay, so um, um, she's asking that what we, we, we um, I was saying that um, companies in Europe are requiring companies from the North America to produce certificates of sustainability. So she's asking what is preventing uh, 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 them from doing so. Okay, so this is the thing. Europe started working on sustainability way before us, before North America. If you look at all the, most of the um, sustainability metrics that have been developed, they all came from Europe, from Netherlands, from Germany. Of course, in the last few years, there's been a few that came from North America. Like in, in, in Canada, we had the uh, Impact 2002 that came from, from uh, Chirag in, in Montreal here. Yeah. So, but we're late to the party. If you look at the data in terms of uh, uh, reducing environmental impact, you can see that Europe is doing better. 
than we are doing. And so what is happening is, is that the because it's a policy in, in Europe, they are already doing it and they've been doing this for a while and now are requiring those that are supplying to them also to provide the certificate. Now, to do so, you have to actually do a life cycle assessment of your process and have it certified. Um, at the moment, the, the, the global certification is done by ISO. They have a unit, um, ISO 14,040 and 44. And so when you do your um, life cycle assessment, you need to send it for, for them to check whether you actually did the, the, the right thing. Other than that, then people will just wake up and say, oh, I'm sustainable. And that's it, take my word for it. Yeah, but it doesn't work like that. Just one more thing. Does the, the assessment that you're talking about that they would do, does that include the, just the impacts of shipping a, a product from here to here? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, and so when you do a life cycle assessment, you decide where you want to focus. You can do what we call the cradle to grave, which means you start from the very beginning, how the materials are extracted till um, consumption and after use, what happened after consumption. But sometimes you can choose to just look at where you have control. So if I'm a processing company, um, I may decide to look at what comes into my company and what leaves. So I do a gate to gate, which is focused on where I have control. But maybe I'm also interested in what comes, uh, how the produce that I get is done. And so I would require data from my supplier that, okay, can you tell me how you produce this? And then you can extend it. So depending on the decision where you want to focus on. I have a question online. Um, hi, thank you very much for the presentation. I please have a question. So, like you, you um, emphasize the need for educators, like those in academia, to um, educate and communicate um, their findings to people. But how do we address the controversies within, um, like, uh, researchers? So, for instance the effect of um the, or the health implication of fat or like you know like because you, you have researchers having different findings and you know um this confuses uh, the people then secondly just um on the same subject um please what do you think about sprouting because i remember with um dr josephine's finding she, she said sprouting is good but your presentation you're saying it, you lose uh, nutrients when you sprout uh, beans. Please, can you just clarify that? Thank you. Okay. Right. So let's start with the first one with the communication part. And this, within Canada, the Canadian Society of Nutrition is doing a lot of work on this. Um, if you look at the 20... 14 or 15 conference, it was on nutrition communication. And so they did a very good job of um, debunking some of the things that are not true, because this is a team of all the nutrition experts that we have. But it's not enough if it's only done at a conference and they have a communique and which is good, but that information needs to go up. Of course, it's on YouTube. I saw some of the videos on YouTube, but how do we make that information more readily available to the, the, to, to the masses, to consumers? That is what is lacking. And it's lacking across, but not only nutrition, across different, uh, different sectors. And so we do well to do the research. Of course, sometimes we disagree with what other people have done, but that's why we have these associations and we have uh, 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 policy makers, the, the, the government section that ensures what information goes out because they, we have the Canadian uh, Health Guide and all of these things provide information on some of, some of these misinformation. And I think that we have not done so well when it comes to uh, providing this type of information in a way that can easily be understood. 
Now, with the second one on the beans, yes, sprouting is great, but sprouting is not soaking. So soaking is when you put the, the beans in water and then the following morning, you just um, take the beans out and you cook it. But when you sprout, you put it in water for some time and allow it to begin to germinate. And when you begin to germinate, then you stop the process. And sometimes you can just mill it into um, a powder and use that. That process enhances the nutraceutical component like polyphenols and all of that, not necessarily the, the, um, the minerals, but the nutraceutical aspect and it's, it's enhanced. And so that, those were different things, but mostly um, from the work that I showed, it was not on the sprouting, but it was when you just soak it and then the following day you throw the water away and then you put new water and cook it. That's what I was referring to. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the clarification. Thank okay. you. Yeah, there are two questions. So we go here and then we come back. You, uh, one of your slides said 30% of the food uh, it goes to waste. I suspect that's a North American predominant waste pile. I suspect it's not the same number in Africa, for example. Um, and, and if that's the case, what if you did a Pareto analysis of the waste, what would the top three items be? What would the top three attributes be? Would it be rotting? Would it be uh, uh, just throwing it away because you didn't want it? Would it be bruising? Would it be... What, what, what are okay. the top three, the three or four um, contributors to that waste? Um, and then the flip side of that is if that waste energy mass could be converted into the equivalent of uh, 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 a low nutrition diet environment, then, then, then we can solve many, many problems. But anyway, I, okay. I'm not going to so, solve that. So, yeah, thanks for the question. So it's different from the developing countries and the developed countries. So in the developing country, it's usually not food waste. It's food loss because the food is produced on the farm, but does not even get to people because we have maybe bad roads to transport the food. There is no storage system. And so that- But you could do the Pareto analysis for that. And what would be the top two items? Okay, good. So if you put them together. No, put them, take them apart because, because they're two different universes. That's not okay. what I'm getting to. Okay. That's now, getting to. if you look at it from the food loss, which is more on the developing country, then the, the top three issues is um, infrastructure in terms of storage. Because we they do not have the capacity to store and if you look further down that could be maybe energy sources because in in developing countries a lot of the produce is produced by small scale farmers if you come to north america we have large farms they have the capacity i mean look at when covid came they got subsidies from government that does not exist in, in Africa or Latin America. And so that capacity to enhance, let's say storage or transport, it's not there. And so you sell what you could when you can. But on the other side, if you come to the developed world, there's minimum loss, but it's the behavior and the reason why it's difficult in North America is because it's individual behavior, what we do at home. I mean, people go to Costco, buy a lot of stuff, and then they keep it there until it's, it's, it's rotten. Uh, oh, it's expired, and then they throw it away. So it's difficult to solve that problem because it's a behavioral problem, not a technology problem. And so... The, 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 the component of education and communication would have to continue so that people are conscious of this. Okay, I, I will just put forward. You said, what does the consumer want? You asked what the consumer wants. You said, we should, 
the, the industry is supplying should be listening to what the consumer wants. Okay, well, we just described a situation where a consumer wants to go to Costco and buy 200 tomatoes and he ends up throwing out 30% of them. And, and, but he doesn't, that's not what the consumer wants. It's what the consumer is being led to believe that he wants. Okay. <laughs> and, 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 and it's it, it, like, it's, it, it, Oh, yeah, I, 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 I get your yeah, I, I get your point. I think when when it comes to what consumer wants, this is in terms of what they will buy. Now, after the purchase, what they do afterwards also is a culture thing. Because if you grew in a home where food waste is not accepted, it becomes part of you. If, if you grew in a home where you, you don't buy box stuff, your parents were not buying box stuff, they were buying um, um, based on what they need, it naturally becomes part of you. But the dynamics changes when people get more money. When, when things get better, things then change. So there are several dynamics to this in addressing it. That's why we need more than a food scientist or a food processor or a nutritionist. We need a complete set to understand the whole, the big picture and to see what solutions would help in solving this problem. I think there was a question. Oh, we're going to pause here and we can take the rest of the questions after. But we're at the top of the hours. <laughs> So I just gonna I just gonna formally conclude since we've we've exhausted our hour. Um, never fear if you have questions either in person or online. We'll entertain those questions after we've closed. But I do want to thank Mieza for taking the time to come and address us this evening. It was a great talk. Thank you. Very much appreciated. Um, and I also want to invite those of you who are here and those of you who are watching online to join us again in two weeks for our next lecture. I just want to put up a little flag. The timing is a bit different. So the next event will be on October 17th, which is a Monday. It will be at 10 o'clock in the morning because we are cooperating with the Global Food Security Institute. Um, and we'll be listening to the Margaret A. Gilliam lecture in celebration of World Food Day. Um, we'll be listening to Denise Mariella Johnson, who will be discussing a theme that Mieza mentioned at the end of his talk, uh, effective communication in the development of policies for food and nutrition security. So I invite you all to join us Monday, October the 17th at 10 o'clock in the morning. It will be in the faculty lounge here in the entrance to the McDonald Stewart complex. And so with that, I wish you a good evening if you plan to leave us now. Um, but if you'd like to stay online or stay here in person and talk for a little while, you're more than welcome to do that. Thank you very much for joining us.